Yes. Uh, over to you, Satish. We are live. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, today is a good, excellent uh, Sunday morning, and uh, we will be having a presentation on uh, all the labral pathologies and uh, some uh, uh, difficult and uh, difficult to handle uh, labral pathologies like multidirectional instabilities and panlabral uh, tear. So here we have two excellent faculties, Dr. Jeffrey Abraham from Princeton, New Jersey, and Dr. Sanjay Desai from uh, Mumbai. So uh, now we will start with uh, Jeffrey's presentation on uh, multidirectional instability and slap tear. So over to you, uh, Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I guess uh, <clears throat> what we'd really like to cover today is multidirectional instability. A uh, couple different pathways to discuss. Uh, first of all, defining the problem, because when you read the literature, it is uh, somewhat confusing. It, uh, <clears throat> even the original article by Nier and Foster may even raise some questions between traumatic events and labor congenital or laxities that becomes a, and we'll define better what multidirectional is. There's something called bidirectional. And I think that bidirectional would be uh, uh, something with anterior and posterior findings, not necessarily inferior findings. So let's let's get into the presentation and maybe we could discuss with questions at the end. I have a number of uh, companies that I have done some work for, uh, presentations and perhaps developed some uh, technique and equipment as well as board, being on the instability. And it has to be symptomatic. So just because someone is loose jointed and has uh, shoulders that move in multiple directions, it does not necessarily make it a multi-directional instability unless there's increased symptomatic inferior translation combined with either anterior, posterior, or both. Now, most of us discuss patients or present patients who have a sulcus sign and they look at the pouch as uh, the humeral head subluxing into the pouch as this picture depicts. But the truth of the matter is, uh, there are many, many good and high level athletes with large pouch, and they don't necessarily have a multi-directional instability unless that inferior translation becomes symptomatic. And this is what it may look like on a case. Uh, to the left, you see the humeral head sitting in the pouch, just based on the arm traction being minimal, it doesn't sit in the glenoid. And the clinical exam is actually one coming from my fellowship in the 1980s. And it has a couple hallmarks. It has the sulcus sign. It had meaning inferior translation, creating dimpling above the humeral head and rotator cuff. But also it has the scar from a failed operative procedure. And this was fairly classic in the mid 1980s. That's when it, defi it was defined in 1980 by Nier and Foster. But the truth is doing a unidirectional operation on this entity is going to lead to failure. What are some of the physical findings? Well, here's a girl who shows you she has external rotation approaching 90 degrees. But if you look closely on the top of her shoulder, she has a scar from a previous procedure. That scar is widened. It's not normal tissue. It's more than just a keloid. It tells you a little bit about her collagen. Then you have the arm that you could put not only in neutral rotation, but external rotation and perform a draw sign. Uh, this picture by a good friend, Dr. Burks, and he shows that the sulcus sign is unchanged. This would suggest that the rotator interval is insufficient in this patient. So it's not only the inferior capsule ligaments, whether there's a pouch or not, but it's also the superior structures that limit inferior translation. Beware, however, there are collagen disorders that can give people very loose joints. That being said, if they're asymptomatic, they're certainly, you could call it multidirectional laxity, but there's a whole entity called Erlos Danlos, and I trust you, that if we were to read surgical results of soft tissue procedures 
on patients with Erlos Danlos, the results would be horrific. So this is not an entity that you really want to uh, offer surgical procedures to because of the high risk of failure. The other thing that's very interesting about multidirectional, it's, a, it's more than just an anatomic problem. It's a physiologic problem. The scapula tries to keep the humeral head in its center. And there are a number of patients that get scapula dyskinesis because the scapula moves in a way that not only does not center the humeral head, but can actually lead to posterior subluxation. And so I have a number of patients with posterior subluxation and winging of the scapula. If you stood behind this patient and pressed on their scapula, you'd realize that they cannot really translate their humeral head out the back. So this is a disconnect. Their, their brain does not really realize what they're doing. This is not voluntary, but it is demonstrable. And so this is something that you try to connect the patient uh, to a good physiologist or a physical therapist. And certainly even in the post-operative course, you have to correct this winging of the scapula. It has nothing to do with the, uh, the long thoracic nerve and the serratus. A number of tests have been helpful for understanding translations. This was a study that my mentor, Dr. Hawkins, got me interested in when I was in London, Ontario. And we did something called a load and shift exam. In fact, that's where it got started in the 1980s. And basically it was a grading system on a patient to translate the humeral head anteriorly, posteriorly, and inferiorly, and try to create a, tr a system of grading where one was a partial translation, two got to the humeral head to the edge, and three dislocated it. Often when you let go of a number two, it centers the head back. When you let go of a number three, it doesn't always center the humeral head. And this became a common exam for actually multidirectional, which was the original. However, I use this commonly in all my cases of instability, both on the awake, as you can see on the left, and the sleeping patient. Most patients should be addressed with non-operative treatment. And we have to understand what's the chances of success. Well, a loose jointed individual has their humeral head resting on the edge of the cliff or the edge of the glenoid. They don't always have their humeral head centered. And the question really is, what is the little bit of loss of control that can occur? Is it traumatically induced, which is sometimes the case? Patients loose jointed, they don't have much protection. They have an event and they have a small labral tear, maybe a Kim lesion, which is a really a not an anatomic labral tear. And all of a sudden they become a multi-directional unstable shoulder. And again, you can't necessarily treat them with a unidirectional procedure. There's the atraumatic or the overuse like the swimmer who's loose jointed and they get an imbalance in their scapula thoracic and their glenohumeral muscles and they become symptomatic, multidirectional, unstable individuals. But the emphasis on a non-operative program is working on the scapula stabilization exercises. And this is not just a, a closed chain, it's open and closed chain. And bracing sometimes in jackets are, have been used to help with the patients who don't appreciate they have winging of the scapula. Remember the rotator cuff has attachments to the capsule. So that being said, the capsule provides proprioception, the capsule has the ligaments. And so if we work on the cuff, we can sometimes improve the capsular properties. This can become disabling to an individual. They can't lift up their pocketbook or their groceries or their suitcase or their computer case because the shoulder can sublux inferiorly. But you can see how this can interfere with their sports and actually be interfering with their work uh, depending on their job. So Gary Missimore from Indianapolis looked at this and published this in Journal Shoulder and Elbow. He said, what do you think our degree of success is? And this is a nice study because not only does it look at a fair number of patients, but he's an ex he, does, he has extensive uh, history with patients. And in fact, he did follow up at two years and again, follow up at eight years. 
And you can see that the results of the non-operative program, which was tried on most individuals, was not really so good. Uh, probably about half of the patients improved and the other half did not improve. In fact, many of them required surgery. The interesting thing is in the original Near and Foster article, they talked about a year of non-operative management. And in today's day and age, uh, that doesn't seem like it happens often. And in fact, Gary Missimore's comment was, if they do not improve in the three months of reg regulated therapy, they're not likely to be any better at one year. So we do see these patients and let's assume for the moment that we have laxity, symptomatic laxity with an inferior direction, but these are not necessarily Erlos Danlos collagen patients. You can see here, I, I prefer the lateral decubitus because I need to be able to go in the front and the back. But you could also see here, based on this, the gentle flexion of the elbow, there's very little traction. In fact, the arm is almost just suspended in the air. So you don't necessarily want to pull the humeral head into the inferior pouch. This is a patient under anesthesia. Before I position him, I'd like to see the sulca sign. Again, it doesn't take much to provoc provocation. I look at their range of motion. It's usually quite good. And I translate the humeral head and I try to grade the system. A little instability, a little of surgery and big instability, big surgery. It's right about this moment I'm making decisions on how much tissue should I plicate. That combined with my intraoperative diagnosis will tell me sometimes whether I'm taking a suture hook and taking a small amount of tissue or large bites to create the stability of the shoulder. It's interesting how many patients that when you put the scope in, there's very little damage. In fact, there's a small little labral rent underneath the humeral head on the left, but not enough to say this is a bank heart lesion. The picture on your upper right would show you deficient capsule of tissue. And again, something interesting, and we'll talk about a little bit is slap lesions or superior labral tears. And that's what the picture is for this diagnostic uh, arthroscopy on a multidirectional unstable patient. Here's a patient that has had multiple surgeries. He's a college uh, advanced student. He uh, has had two separate surgeries and he's presenting to me for his third surgery. He had a posterior stabilization. There's the sutures, the suture anchors. I didn't do any of these operations. So he was doing well for a short period of time. Then he required a second operation to do an anterior capsule labor repair. But here's what I found when I was doing his revision of his revision is that he had a superior labral tear. And so I think that when we talk about slaps, we, there are many other causes, but I think that slap lesion could be an indication of a form of instability and specifically inferior instability. In fact, in my, let's say last 10 years, I may have taken care of about four or five uh, gymnastic coaches that attempt to catch the individual athletes from coming off their equipment. And the downward traction has caused them the superior capsule labral tears. So we still see this problem and it becomes interesting. We need to do something to the capsule if we're gonna sew it. We don't wanna make holes in it. So we turn the suction off and use our shaver. And we can use these suture hooks to grasp the capsule understand what's the length of the tip. So if we want to, let's say, take a one centimeter, 1.5 centimeter plication, we can do this because we know the length of our instruments. And we pass, uh, it's called a, a pinch tuck where we pass the hook through the capsule and then separately through the labrum. And we can pass both monofilament sutures that can either be left as monofilament sutures or exchange for some form of braided suture. I think that uh, stabilizing the labrum when the labrum is not healthy is better to use with anchors. And this is more commonly posteriorly on some of these individuals. Anteriorly, the labrum is sufficient. And so we'll put an anchor in and put our sutures in below the labrum <coughs> to, uh, to make this. I also am gonna make a plea for some mattress sutures to try to keep the knots away from the humeral head. 
So simple sutures certainly uh, can roll the labrum up, but a mattress suture can do the same. And I think that this is healthier because in these cases, the humeral head will translate anteriorly and posteriorly over the labrum and over the knots. And we want to minimize articular cartilage damage. Let's go through this. This is a left shoulder of a multidirectional unstable. You can see some greater pathology posteriorly. In fact, the symptoms were greater posteriorly. And here we're just roughening up the capsule adjacent to the labrum. My first stitch is going to be a monofilament suture. This is a six o'clock stitch. It so it's a set the tone for what I'm gonna do the rest of the way. And I'm gonna look at the areas coming in. I'm gonna come in from an oblique angle, post or a lateral portal to put in an anchor for the posterior. You saw the labrum was already uh, attritional. And here I'm gonna go into that inferior pouch and pull up the entire capsule labral complex, use a monofilament as a shuttle. And the goal here is to actually create mattress sutures. And I think that that's because not only can I roll the labrum up on the bone in a preferred fashion, I could push the capsule against the glenoid, but I also could keep the knots away from the humeral head. I'll close my posterior portal with a side to side. In this case, although it's braided, it's not reinforced. So it's not as, as abrasive to the humeral head. And now I move to the front to create a balanced repair. So I'm grasping the inferior glenohumeral ligament and I can do a, a uh, either monofilament sutures, but I want the humeral head to remain in the center. You can take a humeral head and if you do your primary repair anteriorly, you could push it out posteriorly and vice versa. So you want some sutures on the contralateral side to stabilize this multidirectional shoulder. And this is a diagram from Steve Snyder showing you how he likes to approach, let's say a more symptomatic posterior where he does both posterior and inferior and anterior repairs. And this is what the capsule may look like uh, with sutures in it. The humeral head is now centered. It doesn't have as a biggest uh, space to pass the scope through the uh, joint itself. Well, we're not done with these. We, we generally want to be, make the capsule a bit thicker. So in the lower left-hand corner, you see the side-to-side -side sutures. I can pass in the capsule to make it thicker. And the pictures on the right is a rotator interval closure. And this has come under some controversy on whether or not this is beneficial. Again, in a true multi-directional, this is not the same thing as a loose shoulder as in an overhead throwing athlete. Here would be a case. This is a right shoulder lateral decubitus. I'm putting in my final mattress suture just to create this uh, tightness of this anterior, actually the upper band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. I'll use this monofilament suture to bring it through. I've already done the inferior part of the operation and I'm just tightening up the more superior capsule labral sutures and I can again push the labrum up on the bone nicely. Now I'm going to grasp the outside ligament and then through the subscapularis upper border. I'll also sometimes try to capture the upper border of the middle ligament and now I'm going to go through the superior ligament. I do not want to go near the biceps tendon. The idea is not to put tension or, or pressure on the biceps, it's to reduce the interval along the upper border of the subscap and it's really more than just the superior glenohumeral ligament to the middle, because I'm really on the outside of the subscapularis, meaning I capture the, cap, uh, the coracohumeral ligament when I do it. Here's one of my reps who had multidirectional instability. This is what she may look like at one year or even six months. If they come back at six months and they have full range of motion, I am a bit pessimistic that we've done every, anything for the shoulder because they're gonna go right down the same path. Look at her left shoulder. Doesn't have the same external rotation. You notice it more even when she brings her arm up in a throwing and she's a volleyball player. She has a little bit of loss of abduction external rotation, but not enough that she notices because her elevation is symmetric, but even her internal rotation has subtle differences. If this is your clinical result at one year, I think both you and your patients will be happy. If you describe this to them preoperatively and they say that would be unacceptable, I'm not sure you can do better because the closer you get to perfect, the closer they are to the edge of the cliff 
where they can fall off with another small event. What about slap tears? Well, this is interesting. I mentioned earlier that there's certain individuals with slap tears that are really have problems of instability. In this particular case, I want to talk about occasionally a patient with multidirectional instability, as I showed you earlier on that graduate student, can also have a superior labral tear. I don't really believe it has to do much about the biceps anchor, but the biceps anchor is involved because of its attachment to the superior labrum. In this particular case, the early repairs of slap tears were popularized as taking the biceps and anchoring it back to the glenoid. I would discourage you from doing this. The biceps needs to move with shoulder rotation, particularly with throwing motions. And this may be one of the reasons why many slap tears became too tight and patients were very unhappy with their results. Yes, they were stabilized, but they didn't return to their range of motion that they would need to to return to sport. And in our throwing world, in our baseball world in North America, this has been just a very difficult operation to achieve. And I'll welcome your comments afterwards. For me, the anchor goes a little bit more medial than what we do in the inferior quadrants. We put it on the, uh, on the abraded surface, and I'd like mattress sutures to go through the labrum and avoid the biceps. This is what this may look like. This is a slap tear that's symptomatic, extends somewhat posteriorly. And what we're going to do is put an anchor in after we abrade the surface of the glenoid neck. There are different forces on this because not only do you have the translation of the labrum, but you have the biceps pulling on this. So we're gonna put an anchor in just along the posterior margin of the biceps, maybe a little bit more posterior, a couple millimeters. We really do not want to operate on the biceps. Now I can use my anterior cannula and come in from behind. Whether you went through the supraspinatus to put that anchor, I don't think it's irrelevant, but you could sometimes miss the supraspinatus by the anterior edge. And now we're creating these mattress sutures behind the labrum. We're stabilizing the labrum. I think it's a unique case. You don't usually want to go in front of the biceps unless this is a Bankart combined slap tear. And now when I'm done, I'm still concerned about tightness, even though that biceps can move. So I actually divide the capsule between the labrum and the rotator cuff. That's the supraspinatus muscle tendon fibers that I'm, you're gonna see there. And so that will reduce the likelihood of tightness after a slap repair. Postoperatively, they are immobilized. When it's a slap tear, I often move them a little earlier. When it's multidirectional instability, I usually move them a little later. I want them to gain scapula stabilization. So exercises are done supine before they're upright. I want to work on isometrics to the scapula followed by cuff strength. So to conclude, we talked about a bunch of things today. We talked about directional instability. We asked to avoid some of the problems of Erlo Stanlos and tried to work with patients who may have either a pouch that has evolved from overuse or potentially a traumatic event that changed a loose shoulder into a symptomatic shoulder. The difference here is you can't just do a bank card to the shoulder because you run the risk that you'll create contralateral, not contralateral, but symptoms that develop on the other side of the joint. Anterior approaches can push the head posteriorly, posterior approaches can push it anteriorly. So you need a balanced repair. There is a number of patients that will surprise you and actually have a slap tear. In that case, you should be pleased because what's the complication of slap repairs? A little stiffness. And if they get a little stiffness, they'll be even happier with their results because they restored their stability. I do believe there's a case for rotator interval closure, but it's not just the superficial capsule. It's the, it's the tissue on both sides of the subscapularis, meaning the coracohumeral ligament. And in cases of true laxity that became symptomatic, meaning multidirectional instability, most cases, your rehabilitation is slower than in our classic label repairs. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeff. It was a nice, wonderful presentation.
uh, and welcome uh, dr sanjay desai sir sir your take on uh, these uh, 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 this methods and how you deal with uh, uh, multi directional instability patients uh good morning everybody forgive me i got a little a little late uh, uh but uh, wonderful presentation jeff as usual good morning to you and uh uh i tend to agree with uh, most of the things that jeff said i do a similar i have a similar approach to mdi uh uh most uh, i tend to opt for conservative treatment only if these mdis are not responding to conservative treatment then i do operate on them i do a capsular plication quite similar to jeff my only difference is uh, i tend to go away from interval closure uh, i used to do them uh, say about 8 9 years ago uh, and i feel that uh, uh, the main problem is in the lower equator of the joint uh below the equator the problem is uh inferiorly uh so it makes uh, uh less sense to me to tighten the capsule from the top and i would be more aggressive uh antero inferiorly and posterior inferiorly where i feel the main pathology lies so i have moved away from interval closure and uh, regarding slap uh, i have not been a great fan of slap repairs from the very beginning uh almost 25 years ago uh of course one reason could be we have uh, less of baseball uh, uh in our country but we do have many throwing sports and i fully agree with jeff that do not strangulate the biceps when you do a slap repair uh you strangulate the biceps and you will have problem you'll have pain and stiffness so i tend to operate like jeff showed only behind the biceps and not in front of the biceps as far as i can okay uh, nilesh uh, do you use the same uh, method for uh, uh, plicating the capsule or uh, as some surgeons uh, incise the capsule and do a double breasting like uh, procedure so do you follow that or the same like jeff it's pretty much similar so uh, it's not that i would say that i had a vast experience on multidirectional and uh, i operated only two cases in the last 5 to 6 years at that i can i can recollect but what i do is i tend to use uh, uh, a knotless kind of anchor which allows me to to assess the amount of suture which has been taken in and that allows me to to plicate the capsule yes i do tend to do uh, when i use knotted anchors i tend to use uh, mattress bites and try to keep the knots away from the from the capsule or from the articular surface but what i wanted to ask for both the faculties if i may is how do you how do you assess the centration of the head post plication that means as we know that if we tighten on one side you can have symptoms coming from the opposite side because of an iatrogenic tight repair so is the traction taken off and then the centration is assessed or do we assess the centration of the head with the traction post repair Jeff, you can answer that. Yeah, great, very excellent question. I, I first of all, I think there's the distortion. Once you vent the capsule, uh, even if you don't even push water in, your humeral head will often have some inferior subluxation, even in shoulders that are not unstable. Uh, we look with the scope often, and we see the head is sitting on the inferior labrum. often on the anterior inferior labrum in a normal shoulder that we're about to fix their cuff problem or do a decompression on so the central that's why i think that i appreciate the palpation of the shoulder preoperatively meaning i before i roll them in lateral decubitus i do a load and shift test and try to appreciate how much translation the humeral is head, head moves and therefore how much am a bite can i get now I think it is perfectly reasonable to see the head without the traction but really what you're looking for is centralization if you're getting towards the end of the case and the head is still in the inferior pouch then you have a problem uh if it's anteriorly or posteriorly you have a problem you do, you want to see it but it will only cover the inferior quadrant of the glenoid 
it will not look like it's in the center. And that's because the amount of water that has entered during the shoulder during the operation. So even if you let the water out, which of course invites the bleeding in, you still won't. So I think you have to sort of develop in your hands prior to, prior to me washing hands, I'm already in my mind setting in how much of a plication I'm going to take. And then my intraoperative is to sometimes put the sutures in and not tie them uh, if I think it's getting tight, but it's sort of counterintuitive to feel that the shoulder is getting tight in these shoulders because they're so loose to start with. So Steve Snyder used to put his arms up in greater degree of abduction so he would not over tighten them. He put it up in 60 degrees in the air instead of let's say 20 or 30 or 45. Um, I, I think that visually it's very difficult. So I would, if I'm unsure, I take the arm out of traction and I try to translate anteriorly and posteriorly. But I will say it's not as reliable as you would like because you've already put water in the shoulder for a period of time and the tissues are not like native tissue at that point. Right, thank you. Dr. Desai, any different thoughts or? So, like the, the only one remark, I think in spite of all the advances and experience that we all have had uh, uh, with Jeff's massive uh, experience and, and, and rest of the world, I think one of the problems still which remains unaddressed is how to quantify the capsule. Uh, there is no method still available where you can say that the capsule is X percentage or millimeter loose. And therefore, uh, I will uh, reduce or shrink the capsule by eight millimeters or 10 millimeters. Uh, so that is where we are stuck. We, we don't have a method. And I think Nilesh, you might be aware that I've been working on how to quantify uh, uh, capsule laxity. Uh, I will touch upon that in my talk uh, as we go along. Okay. Let me go back to Sanjay's comment just for a second, if I can. He's absolutely right. There is a publication on, uh, maybe it came from, I'm not exactly sure, so rather than misquote the author, but it did talk about if you were to do in a cadaver, a taking a suture hook and let's say doing one centimeter of plantation, what would be the reduction of the volume of the shoulder? So there is something in the literature to give us some guidance, but here's where it may not be totally helpful to you. These patients will often stretch out to their original length. So no matter what you've done with the stitches, their body is programmed to be a certain length capsule. So I think that Sanjay's work is gonna be valuable because they will often return to, uh, first of all, their other shoulder has the same laxity many times and it's asymptomatic, and the shoulder you fix may be clinically improved, but often restores the majority of that length of that ligament. So something evolves or remodels, but nevertheless, I think we do have some guidelines of what a suture hook can do, uh, and probably the volume of the joint reduction we can at least estimate by that publication. So may I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask uh, if uh, you are over tightening it and uh, over the period, if the joint is going to be loose. So how do we counsel the patient uh, in what period his joint will become loose and uh, he might become symptomatic later on? And if uh, we tell that if uh, the patient gets ready for the uh, plication surgery or... Yes, sir. Yes, Jeff. Yeah, I caught just the first half. I'll, I'll t and you could help me if I missed the second half of your question because it cut out. But my, my first half is, um, I'll give you an example of a person who I know will stretch out. I get a 14 year old swimmer, sexually immature, and they swim and they're very accomplished and they have no control of their scapula and regardless of rehabilitation, we are not getting them back to swimming. The parents are upset with me, the patient's upset with their shoulder and we're getting frustrated. Do a pan capsule application and I will tell the family, 
if they continue to swim in three years, they'll be exactly back where they were at this time, meaning that they will stretch out. They come back three years later and they think you're brilliant. Why you're, this will be the first time you get congratulated on failure, surgical failure, because you told them that they would stretch out. So the truth of the matter is this type of patient will often stretch out. It's very much an exception if they don't stretch out and they become too tight, but you need to sort of stay within some anatomic guidelines. Again, the examination under anesthesia, the degree of symptomatology, realize that you're not just fixing these patients with sutures. What you're trying to do is recreate a proprioception that will allow them to restore their scapular coordination. And if their scapula becomes coordinated again, it's really not how tight you made the shoulder. So what they really don't appreciate is they cannot appreciate their shoulder in space. They do not know when they're getting into certain positions because their capsule is so loose. And so they are getting winging of the scapula and these uh, incorrect adaptive mechanisms. So what you're trying to do is just tip them back into a place where their reinforced proprioception allows their exercises to get better. Now, the second part of this that makes you look very good is as you get older, you get tighter. I would almost venture to say that everybody that I can see their face on the screen will say they are a little stiffer than they were five years ago. And so once you get to a point in life and you don't have to get to my point in life, it'll happen earlier, um, they, they will possibly outgrow this issue. And so it's related to their activities and so you're trying to buy a period of time of proprioception, capsule tightness, coordination, rehabilitation. But a lot of what we do with our success in this diagnosis is rehabilitative and not necessarily always surgical corrective. Thank you. Uh, right. if, I may, if I may ask in a question, uh, Satish? Yes, sir. So, Right, so uh, just touching on the same point, and again, uh, for, for both Dr. Desai as well as Dr. Abrams. Uh, so I have this patient who is uh, typically a 21-year-old girl who's been operated earlier overseas for a capsule application. A Biton score is around six by nine, and uh, she has come back with a failure, and it's primarily an inferior dynamic kind of subluxation, and she's quite painful. Uh, any, any thoughts on, on the so-called coracohumeral ligament reconstruction, or how would you go about uh, managing this case other than rehab? Because primarily, I don't have an option for her, and I have put her on rehab for her scapula. But, but any thoughts on this? Yes, Sanjay, sir? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's how many years since the operation? Two and a half years. So and this she's, is a. She's an Ehlers-Danlos variant. She's not a classical Ehlers-Danlos, but she has a systemic illness going on. Yeah, six or nine is very, very uh, high amount yes. of uh, collagen problem. Yes. And uh, it's a difficult situation. Uh, I would not jump into a revision surgery very quickly. That's point number one. Yes. Uh, I will really exhaust and counsel well with the patient that it is a difficult situation. She is genetically programmed to have a poor collagen tissue, which cannot be rectified by anybody. And after having uh, tried rehab extensively and after having counseled the patient, uh, if you had to, then you could do a revision, uh, uh, global capsular uh, uh, tightening. Uh, uh, but, but with a guarded prognosis. And you must uh, warn the patient that uh, there is a high risk that it may not work. Right. And, and any experience with the coracohumeral ligament reconstruction as described by Matt Provincia? No, I don't. Mm. I'm not a great fan of that uh, concept. Right, sir. Right. Uh, yeah, the, car the coracohumeral concept really came from J.P. Warner and Russ Warren. And they started looking at if the shoulder was, let's say the shoulder is abducted, the inferior capsule becomes responsible of stability. But in adduction, it's really the superior structures that limit the inferior translation. 
But if you think about the coracohumeral ligament, it depends on what the sport and the activity is. And what you're trying to do is create some stiffness to that shoulder. So the chance of improvement would be if they, she had a neglected slap tear, but that's really not the case with this Erlos Danlos patient. I hate to say this, but you really, uh, Sanjay is spot on. You try to stay away. And it's interesting. I think the doctor who did the patient's surgery probably did a pretty good job because they have limited anterior and posterior translation. But you really can't limit the inferior translation as well as you would like. They have this problem with an axillary nerve down there. And so you don't want to placate your nerve to your capsule. So you got to be a little bit limited on how you grab the inferior capsule to bring it up. Here's your, if you are absolutely compelled because there are activities of daily living, I think you're looking at something called a galley case where you're using a exogenous graft and you're using a tendon, whether you use a uh, gracilis or semitendinosis, and you're literally grafting the tissue of the inferior capsule. And it's complicated. It can be done with some degree of arthroscopic combined with open to get the axillary nerve out of the way. But I don't know that you're gonna get this done with the patient's native tissue. Again, maybe getting the notes from the original surgeon would help you a little bit on pictures because if it looked very good to you at the end of their case, unfortunately, your outcome may re resemble what was the outcome before. So you'd, like, you'd have to do something different to a improvement. And I agree with Sanjay, just the coracohumeral ligament would not provide because that too is a, is, is a loose tissue in this patient. Right. Uh, one question to you, Jeff. Uh, what are your indications for slap repair versus uh, biceps uh, tenodesis? A patient comes to me and it's pain. They're 40 years old. They have a slap tear. I do biceps tenodesis. A patient comes to me and their complaints is my shoulder comes out. I do a superior label repair. So I need to have some connotation that there's an instability problem that lets me do slap repairs. It's either an anterior, I've been burnt where I had a bank cart that went up to the slap and I just did the bank cart and they still had complaints. They didn't come out, but they had complaints and I went back and did the slap. There was a professional hockey player and I've had patients with multi-directional. I think the complicated is the throwing athlete, and that's where it gets dicey, whether or not they're loose jointed, which is most often the case, versus unstable. And the problem with doing a superior labral repair is the change from unstable to being overly stable. I'll share you a quick story because I don't want to delay Sanjay, but I have a slap tear. And that's the only reason I can serve a tennis ball as fast as I can. So if any one of you surgeons were to fix my slap tear, I would not be able to serve the tennis ball the same way because I would lose my external rotation up here. I prefer my slap tear to stay just as it is until I can't get the ball over the net. So I think that we adapt with slap tears and it happens earlier in life than you think. But I do have wrestlers, I do have gymnasts, I do have people who have an instability pattern and that's the best reward for fixing slap tears and not the patient who says, I have pain and no instability. That would be one you may be doing better work with a tenodesis. Okay, thank you. Uh, Neeraj, uh, do we have so any online questions? No, we don't have it. Okay, so we'll go ahead with uh, Dr. Sanjay Desai's talk. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just sharing my screen. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, IAS and uh, team. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for a wonderful presentation. And do forgive me for a little delay. It's a Sunday morning. Uh, but uh, I have been asked to speak on balanced arthroscopic uh, bank card repair. Now, my talk is going to address not just how I do a balanced bank card repair, but why I do whatever I do. 
and give a little uh, science and few numbers uh, behind my uh, reasoning. So uh, we all know that it's a uh, equipment intensive uh, surgery. You need a lot of equipment without which it will become a difficult uh, proposition and some specialized cannulas and anchors. I like to do all my uh, instability repairs in the lateral position and my choice is because uh, I like the comfort of be having access to 180 degrees of the shoulder front or back uh, with ease. And this is how, this is for relatively young, inexperienced uh, surgeons who are learning shoulder arthroscopy. An extremely important uh, part of your operation is organizing your OR. And you need that, those two arrows that you can see, you need access to the front and back uh, to address any aspect uh, of shoulder instability. And I tend to do a typical three portal technique. Uh, you have the uh, posterior portal, an antero superior portal, an antero inferior portal. And I might modify this portal uh, when I suspect pre-op some posterior uh, labrum tear which I need to tackle and I'll talk about it later in my, in my presentation. Uh, I like my scope to be in the antero superior portal. Uh, uh, and I urge all of you that uh, do not do this operation with the scope in the posterior portal, but in the antero superior portal. Uh, the reason being that the view is, is amazing when your scope is in the antero superior portal. You can see the whole of the neck of the glenoid very well. Uh, and therefore, uh, you will be able to operate with much ease and quickly. We all know the three uh, nerves that you have to take care of. Uh, this is where they lie. You have to be aware. Uh, you have to have a 3D orientation of where the nerves are going to be. Uh, and, and hence uh, make it a safe procedure. Uh, we also know the safe triangle between the uh, biceps uh, long head and the superior edge of subscapularis. Now, the basic concept, what is the aim? Uh, I am a strong believer that uh, any surgical procedure, any, forget about shoulder arthroscopic bank card, any surgical procedure, if your aim is to reconstruct the anatomy, then uh, success is inherent in the procedure. So identify what is pathoanatomy, and if you rectify that pathology in the anatomy, then it is bound to be successful. So now if you look at recurrent anterior dislocation of shoulder, what is the main pathology in this entity? And if I share my experience of, this is an old slide, I have now nearly 3000 cases, and a long-term follow-up recurrence rate of 8%. So what are the observations? What did I see in these uh, 2000 odd cases? Number one, the direction of instability. It is not anterior. Uh, I urge you, have a look at any X-ray of a dislocated shoulder, and you will realize that it is antero-inferior. Uh, like Jeff just mentioned, uh, that when you keep put a scope in, and have a look at this. Uh, we are in the posterior portal and my assistant is just giving a gentle traction. Uh, uh, this is a case of recurrent anterior dislocation and you can see how much it glides inferiorly. You try to do the same thing superiorly, it doesn't happen. These are antero inferior dislocations. I have another uh, example here. Ignore that uh, juicy bank card lesion in front, but concentrate on the lower pole of the glenoid and way beyond. And I will pass a pro to show you that how the lesion extends all the way inferiorly and behind. Some people might call it the Kim's lesion. I don't believe in that. I think it is part and parcel of the same pathology. This humeral head is constantly dislocating or subluxating anteriorly and as much inferiorly. So in some patients, it may uh, tear the labrum, not only anteriorly, but inferiorly and to some extent posteriorly as well. So it is part and parcel of the same uh, patho anatomy. Now that you understand what is the patho anatomy, then we can design our surgery. So we want to rectify what has gone wrong. Therefore, the aim of this surgery is number one, to reattach the capsule labrum complex 
back to the glenoid where it was to tighten the capsule, which has now become loose. And what has become loose from anterior inferior all the way to posterior inferior. You want to tighten the whole hammock. And this is the primary aim of your surgery. If you understand this anatomy, then your surgery is more likely to be successful. Observation number two. Remember that the damage to the capsule labrum complex is not the same in every patient. It's variable. And I have this classification about to be published now. And if you look at type one, two, three, all have a detachment of the capsule labrum complex. But in type one, the labrum is nice and intact. The type two labrum is disappeared. Uh, type three, there is a lot of interstitial damage to the capsule. Type four is a bony banker. And type five, is, is the one which uh, uh, Satish gave an, uh, Nilesh gave an example where there is a huge redundant loose capsule such that the humeral head can sit in front of the glenoid without tearing the capsule labrum complex. So that is seen in about 1%, so it's uncommon. So here is type one in about 34% of cases, nice juicy labrum, uh, simple, straightforward, easy to repair. This is type two. Uh, uh, Jeff would call this the Alpsa lesion. Uh, to me, it is a detachment of the labrum. The labrum happens to fall down somewhere on the neck, rolls up, gets stuck with fibrosis. And this is type two, where there is a detachment, the cap, but, but the labrum is not easily uh, identifiable, seen in 27% of cases. This is type three. This is a, uh, the one to remember. It has a high incidence of failure when you have a lot of interstitial damage to the capsule besides the detachment of the capsule labrum complex. This is seen in about 29% of cases. And of course you have the bony bank art seen in about 10% of cases. And the last one is a loose voluminous capsule uh, where you see the drive through sign. The scope easily goes from front to back and you can hardly see any thickening of the anterior band or the posterior band of IGHL. Observation number three, the main pathology is poor capsule or poor collagen. Why do I say that? Number one, there is a statistically significant correlation between a high failure rate following arthroscopic bank art repair in type three bank art. What is type three bank art, as you saw in that video, uh, where there is a lot of interstitial damage to the capsule. Uh, another important correlation, statistically significant, ligament laxity. 38% of these patients had some amount of laxity and 38% uh, patients had uh, either three or more criteria positive. And there was a significant correlation between the failure rate uh, of arthroscopic bank art repair with ligament laxity. So you have type three, which is interstitial damage to the capsule showing high failure rate. You have ligament laxity criteria four or more uh, having a high failure rate following arthroscopic bank art repair. What does all this imply, indicate that the main problem is poor quality of capsule, poor collagen? Now let me try and see if we can quantify what is to be considered as poor capsule. So here are four different slides of four different patients of recurrent anterior dislocation. You can see all these are anterior bands of IGHL. Uh, on the left top, you see a very robust, strong, healthy, more than eight millimeters anterior band. And then sequentially, it becomes uh, thinner and weaker, I would say. And in the lowermost uh, right-hand side picture, you can hardly see any uh, anterior band. This has to have some significance. It cannot be ignored. It has to have some meaning. And I tried to put in some figures to give it meaning. So if you have anterior band, which is more than eight millimeters, I call it capsule type one. It is a good, healthy, normal capsule. Uh, of course, it can still dislocate. These are all dislocating shoulders. If you have between four and eight, it is capsule type two. Less than four mm, it's capsule type three. And absent is four. And what I found was that if you have type three and type four capsule, which means the anterior band is either four millimeters or lesser 
then there is a st statistically significant high failure rate of arthroscopic bank card repair. So this is a control study uh, of 50 cases of instability, 50 cases of other arthroscopic shoulder surgeries, and I measured uh, the anterior band of IGHL. And look at the, uh, the pathological capsule. If I call it pathological, meaning it is type three and type four, which is four millimeters or lesser. And in the instability group, look at the red block, 58% had four millimeter or lesser. Whereas in a rotator cuff repair, repair case, the control group, it was seen only in 28%, statistically significant. And what I found was that as the generalized ligament laxity worsens, the quality of capsule also worsens, which means that there is a possibility that I can clinically examine uh, Jeff and tell him that your anterior band is gonna be eight millimeters or more. One day, I hope. Uh, now tips for the balance to repair. Uh, uh, if I do this surgery for say uh, 40 minutes, I will spend 20 minutes of my surgical time in mobilizing the capsule and preparing the glenoid edge. Extremely important. Uh, uh, I, uh, the paper uh, has been submitted uh, on uh, 50 cases where I curated the edge of the glenoid, 50 cases I did not curate, uh, half the cases I did not curate, and there is a statistically significant uh, a better result if you curate the edge of the glenoid. And that is not surprising because you are creating uh, uh, an environment for soft tissue to heal into bone. When we all are already aware as orthopedic surgeons that it is always a challenge to get soft tissue to heal into bone. So we must try our best to achieve that by creating a raw bleeding edge of the glenoid, not just the neck of the glenoid and use minimum of three anchors. So this is a animation uh, for my younger colleagues. Uh, uh, it just simplifies the whole technique uh, and helps you understand what you're trying to achieve. So instead of showing uh, actual live uh, surgery, uh, recorded surgery, surgical technique, I'm going to show you this animation. The red is the bank art lesion. The scope is posterior. I'm going to switch the scope. The scope goes anterior superior and the view changes. Spend enough time mobilizing the capsule. Remember your aim is to correct the pathoanatomy. You need not make all the holes in one go. You can do one at a time. The suture which is towards the capsule, you take it behind. Pass a monofilament to railroad that suture. Minimum three anchors, occasionally four and rarely five. Now switch the large plastic cannula posteriorly. If the labrum is not detached, you can use the labrum itself. If the labrum is detached, then you need to use one or two more anchors posterior. And this is how you restore the hammock or correct the pathoanatomy. So this is a surgical technique video, but I'm going to skip that. So what are the problems with why is arthroscopic bank card repair going into disrepute? As we all know that more and more cases are being done with lethargy. Uh, one is that uh, we are not appreciating that about a third of these patients will have poor capsule, poor collagen, which is genetic. Therefore, they are by design not suitable for contact sports, that 30% odd cases. 70%, you do an arthroscopic bank card repair, these 70% do not have a poor collagen, do not have a poor capsule. You do a good arthroscopic bank card repair, you ensure that that capsule heals back to the glenoid, 
they will go back to contact sports uh, quite successfully. But the failure rate is reflecting to be 30-40% in contact sports because you have allowed that 30% or 30 odd percent of patients with who are genetically not designed for those kind of contact sports. So even the God-made shoulder was not suitable for contact sports, they dislocated. And a man-made repair, of course, is not going to be suitable. Of course, we all know that, that uh, bone loss is a contraindication, but my experience is that such huge bone loss, say 20% on the glenoid side, a large engaging hill sex, what is the percentage? We are all gung-ho about bone loss, but what is the percentage out of 100? How many have such large glenoid defects and large hill sacs which are engaging? It's a small percentage, at least in my practice. It's 10% it's odd cases, but therefore 90% still should be suitable for an arthroscopic bank card repair. I, I like lethargy procedure. I perhaps did the first live lethargy live in, in India for Indian Arthroscopy Society a few years back. And here is an example. This, I agree, is a good case to do a lethargy, an ideal case. But once again, I repeat, in what percentage do you have these kind of massive losses? It's a small percentage. And do not forget those fans of arthroscopic lethargy uh, that uh, the shoulder capsule is divine. It is loaded with proprioceptors, mechanoceptors. Don't burn it. Don't destroy it, please. Of course, arthroscopic bank art repair is not an easy procedure. You have to be careful. A uh, lot of things can go wrong, as you can see uh, here. Uh, a reaction with uh, the bioabsorbable anchors, but uh, this was second generation polyglyconate anchors. Thankfully, this resolved with the conservative treatment in this patient. So in summary, arthroscopic bank art repair with suture anchors for traumatic anterior dislocation is a successful technique. And the results are equal to open bank card repair. And I think we should try and evaluate the capsule even more, quantify it, qualify it, assess or quantify the mechanoreceptors and so on and so forth. Uh, thank you very much, uh, IS. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dete. It, it was indeed a wonderful presentation. So, uh, any questions, Jeff? Hi, Karthik. Welcome. Hi, Dr. Can I ask a question to Dr. Yes, sir. Wonderful talk, as always. Um, I was just uh, wondering, what's your indication for Rumplesarge? Do you do Rumplesarge? No, I don't. Again, I don't agree with the concept. Uh, uh, I'm not able to persuade myself to do it. Uh, and the reason is, the reason is, in 2000, the world told us that if you have significant bone loss on the glenoid, soft tissue procedure will fail. There was a consensus, we all agreed. Now the world is telling me that if there is significant bone loss on the humeral side, again, do a soft tissue procedure there. So guys, make, make up your mind. Uh, uh, does a soft tissue procedure in bone loss work or it doesn't work? That's point number one, point number one. Number two, my feeling is that remplissage works very well when you don't need it. Uh, and, and yet there is no clear cut indication. I want uh, evidence-based medicine that exactly which hill sacs, what size of hill sacs, what is your type, uh, type of measurement of hill sacs, which method did you use? And somebody needs to tell me that you use this method of measuring hill sacs, if the size is so much, with the glenoid side so much, then Remplissage has a st statistically significant better outcome. Then I will do it. Okay. Jeff, uh, your take on Remplissage? Yeah, uh, Sanjay, I was muted. I was congratulating you on your talk. So thank you. Very nice talk, nice illustrations. Uh, the remplissage, I think, is a concept that was introduced and now reintroduced. 
And I don't think it should become a routine <laughs> thing. Number one, we understand, or we're trying to understand in a laboratory, what's the critical bone loss? What is the amount of glenoid where if you have this problem, you cannot uh, reestablish stability by a soft tissue procedure, open or arthroscopic. And so the remplissage gets introduced as a additional procedure for patients who are approaching the critical bone loss, but not quite there yet. So we're, we, we have not established whether it's 30%, 25%, 15%, now people are talking about dissatisfaction even with 13 and 12 percent bone loss so i think that it's a little bit uh, the indi I, I agree with sanjay the indications have not really been well established uh that being said uh i have done remplissage on certain patients selectively but the theory to me is a problem because i am going to reduce their arc of motion of the humeral head so if it successfully heals the soft tissue, the infraspinatus and capsule, it will limit my rotation, typically more internal than external rotation, but it'll limit it. And depending on my athlete, that may become unacceptable. So I may be a stable shoulder, but not so good because of the loss of rotation. So I think that as Sanjay pointed out, it's not just an anterior procedure. It's not even just an anterior inferior procedure, but it's also a posterior inferior procedure. So part of the reason the remplissage works is because you're doing posterior capsule plication. And whether or not you put the infraspinatus inside of that is the argument. If I'm willing to take bites and posteriorly plicate my anterior unstable shoulders, I think I can achieve a lot of the same positives from that procedure without involving the infraspinatus. So I will say it this way. The problem with remplissage is it's easy to do. That makes it very attractive to many people. And that may be the wrong indication. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, My, very, very nicely put, Jeff. Uh, no, uh, People who propose uh, remplissage um, as uh, for the exact reason as uh, what you mentioned about plicating the posterior capsule, um, the the proponents say that if you plicate the capsule on the glenoid side, we all know that we all know that the capsule on the posterior aspect of the glenoid is not as strong as the anterior; it's more flimsy. So if you just take the capsule and tighten it on the humeral side, you can take a bit of the cuff as well. So basically it's a capsular disease, but along with a little bit of the robust cuff as well. So you do a better sort of capsular disease. So is that a valid argument? No, it's very valuable. And, and, and I think Sanjay and I agree, really what we're trying to do is capture the inferior capsule posteriorly and bring it up to the posterior glenoid because the pouch and the band of the IGHL is really a much better tissue. And so if we just try to plicate posterior tissue, you're absolutely correct. It will, it'll be a type of tissue, you could almost read a magazine through it. But if you were to go inferior with your hook and then bring that tissue up to the posterior glenoid rim, you would realize you have a better quality of tissue. Okay. Now okay. I'll give you a little trick. Occasionally, I have to reoperate on posterior shoulder instability. And that capsule is stuck to the glenoid, and it's not necessarily a reverse bank card, but it's already a failed procedure. In those patients, I actually go through the not only the capsule, but part of the infraspinatus when I'm putting my sutures in for exactly the reason you suggest. But this is not an athlete po uh, population. This is often just a patient for activities of daily living after failed soft tissue procedure because the capsule has been ablated because of the prior work. Neha, do you have a question? Neha? Yeah, my question uh, to uh, Sanjay, sir. Uh, how does it tackle humeral head bone loss, humeral side bone loss? How, how do I tackle the humeral side and bone loss? So if, which is most often the case, if the humeral bone loss is 
not a very large bone loss, say less than uh, 25 uh, or 30 percent, which is in most cases. Uh, I will ignore the Hillsax lesion. Very occasionally, there is a significantly large 30 percent or more of a, a humoral bone loss. Then I do fill it up with bone. I I lack crest. Okay. Does that answer? Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Yes, and and if I have a combination, which is often the case, uh, uh, of a large hill sacs with a significant glenoid bone loss, it is unusual to get a large humeral bone loss without glenoid bone loss. Usually, these patients will have a glenoid bone loss as well. And in those cases, I will just do a lethargy and again ignore the hill sacs lesion. If I could jump in, I'll answer two questions at once. One was the question posed before. If I see what Sanjay just described, where the glenoid does not have a significant bone loss, but the humeral head does, that's actually my indication for remplissage. Because if, because if the glenoid, I'll do a plication in front, but if there's really no bone loss, I would prefer to just put the soft tissue like in a 20, 25% case. And that would be my indication for remplissage. I think that's maybe one of the best opportunities uh, to actually do that procedure if, you, if I could twist uh, Sanjay's arm just once. Um, yeah, Sanjay, okay. I, have a question. I have a question for you. Okay. As we are getting better at addressing this and we are familiar with ACL surgery and knees, What's your opinion? Do you think that sometimes the grade three, grade four capsule that you described is because of multiple events that if we would have seen that patient after their first, second, possibly their third instability event, that capsule anatomy would have been different and maybe more appropriate for a soft tissue procedure. In other words, can the same patient be any of those depending on when in the history you get into the shoulder to fix it? Uh, if I understand, Jeff, that's a, that's a brilliant question. And, and, and I will answer that because I have been looking at that uh, over the last 25 odd years. Uh, your question is, a patient may have a very good capsule, which is capsule type one, but with multiple events of dislocation, it became capsule type three. Uh, unfortunately, in real life, it's not like that. My observation is that you are born with the type of capsule. It does not necessarily change with the events of dislocation. I am in particular talking about the thickness of the anterior band of IGHL. Okay. Yeah. With, with repeated dislocations, your bank card type can change, which means you had a bank card type one or two. Now I'm not talking about the capsule type. I'm talking about my bank card classification, where you had a detachment of the labrum, uh, but 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 otherwise it was nice and juicy, healthy, like I showed the video. But after many dislocations, you had interstitial damage to the capsule, and that became bank card type three. That I have seen, but the uh, but the quality of capsule is inherent and doesn't change. Uh, Jeff, can I can I ask a question to you? Yeah. Uh, this, uh, you just mentioned about an ideal indication for remplissage uh, is when you have significant bone loss on the humeral side, but not the glenoid side is quite good. Do you agree that that is a very, very uncommon combination? Whenever you have humeral bone loss, which is large, by and large, you will have significant glenoid bone loss. Almost always. In fact, the history that I sometimes, I agree, and uh, the history is sometimes the first dislocation but was not reduced for a prolonged period of time. So it might have been a seizure, it might have been another event where it wasn't recognized, but it wasn't the person who has gone out five or six times because the glenoid goes, gets bad after a number of dislocations. But the humeral head can have the indentation if it's a severe, like a seizure, a one-time event, but not reduction for a longer period of time, the humeral head suffers faster than the glenoid suffers. Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Sanjay sir, I have one question. Uh, yes. Uh, when there is a very poor capsular labral tissue, and uh, you and there is no bone loss on the humeral or as well as the glenoid side, so how you approach that patient? So do you feel con confident of uh, repairing that well? Uh, what is your uh, what goes into your mind while treating such patient? Okay, now this patient before he dislocated. This patient, before he dislocated the first time, was he stable? Yes, he was. With the capsule, whatever God has given him, nature has given him. You agree with that line? Yes. That, so if I can reconstitute his shoulder to what it was before the first dislocation, given the capsule that he has with him, so I will go ahead and do an arthroscopic bank art repair because he does not have a significant bone loss on the glenoid or the humerus, but... I will counsel the patient that nature has designed you not to be a football player. Uh, it is not me, it is nature. I have looked inside your shoulder joint. You are not destined to be a football player. Choose another sport. But if he insists on selecting contact sports, I will warn him that you have a high incidence of recurrent of dislocation. So do you consider uh, uh, closing the rotator interval in such patient? No, I have given that up because I know of two very good uh, level one studies, control double blind. One is from Japan. It is from Itoi, our good friend, uh, where they did uh, say X number of patients without interval closure and Y number of patients with interval closure. And there is no significant difference in the results. And like I said, it doesn't suit my thinking that if the pathology is below the equator, what am I doing on the top? Why? It doesn't make sense. The rotator interval is on the top, whereas the pathology is below the equator of the glenoid. So I would prefer to attack where the pathology is and not an indirect shrinking of the capsule by tackling the rotator interval. To me, it sounds non-physiological. Are you there, Sati? Think, yeah, uh, let me just add one thing. When we're trying to sort through, the literature would be probably more supportive of not fixing the rotator interval. So let's just say where the literature is. Uh, Sagaya likes the interval closure. There are some very well-known people on both sides of this issue. But you heard two different topics tonight. So but to, just to add to the, the, to the recipe here, you heard a very nice talk from Sanjay on a traumatic instability pattern and how he addresses a traumatic event. So that's a little bit different where you're fixing the anatomy back to its original source, assuming the bone will be, be cor it's correct to start with. My topic is a little bit different in the sense that you're trying to create a selective stiffness to the shoulder that it didn't necessarily happen because of trauma. It might have been partially genetic. It might have been due to a repetitive activity. And you're trying to do something that you anticipate will stretch out and go back to its original anatomy, but the patient will remain happy. In other words, they reset, they rebooted their computer. These are two different entities. And so whether an interval closure occurs with one of these operations or the other, you may want to be more select. So let me just give you my years, I have gone from using mostly absorbable sutures in my interval plication, because I think of it more as a stent rather than a fixation point. I think I reposition the capsule and I unload part of the capsule because of the occasional interval closure. I would suggest that I probably do only 25% interval closure, meaning most of my patients do not get them for different reasons. I do, the worst can be, I don't want to take an overhead throwing athlete and do an interval closure because this can really impact. It's almost like a superior label tear. So I think you just have to redefine what are you trying to do? What is the patient bringing to you? What is the patient's anticipated activities? And then you may try to do 
permanent sutures, absorbable sutures, or no sutures. And I think all three of those things I have done over the years, trying to customize the repair. That's all. Can I come in with a quick question for Dr. Desai? Yeah, no, Nilesh, you can go. Right. So, uh, so we know that the articular cartilage on the glenoid is variable in the center and in the periphery. And it tends to be thicker in the periphery, which also adds on to some kind of stability and the concavity compression effect. So my question is, yes, if it's a patient who has been probably dislocating around say six times, five times, you would expect this cartilage to flatten out and it makes perfect sense to take off that cartilage and then create a bony trough for the labrum and the capsule to heal. But what do we do in a relatively acute episode? That means a one-time dislocator or a two-time dislocator where this cartilage may be pristine. That means this cartilage is good enough. Would you still consider taking this out to enhance healing or you would respect that uh, cartilage and try to just uh, put it on the face and allow it to the healing to the, happen to the neck of the glenoid? No, no. <clears throat> it's a very good question, Nilesh. Uh, remember that for years together, orthopedic surgeons have been struggling to get healing of soft tissue to bone. Let me right. take you back to tendo Achilles, patella tendon, quadriceps tendon, rotator cuff. All these are attempts to make the soft tissue heal into bone. So we know from all these experiences that it's a challenge. It's not easy to achieve that. In fact, I do not know of any paper, any paper in the English literature, which has proven that the Bankart lesion has healed successfully. No paper, it's amazing. So <clears throat> my point is that what is the aim of our surgery? We want that capsule labrum to heal into that glenoid. When you already know that it is a challenge, soft tissue to bone healing, you don't want to miss out on anything. You want to create an environment which helps healing of that capsule into bone on the edge of that glenoid. You don't want it to heal on the neck. You are creating the alpsa. You want it to heal flush to the glenoid and hence it is important to cure it, whether it is after one dislocation, two or five or 50, because your best chance of healing is by creating a fresh bleeding surface uh, where in fact, the, the, but of course, keep in mind, I'm not curating half the cartilage. I'm only curating with the four mm, five mm curate. It's only a, a right. four, five mm uh, edge. It's not a massive uh, denuding of articular cartilage. Don't get me wrong, but, mm -hmm. and my anchors will go exactly in that gutter that I created to ensure that the capsule comes and sits nicely in that raw glenoid. And to me, that's the best bet of that structure healing into both. Right. Does Jeff agree with uh, this? Sanjay, I've seen you do your operation and you do it beautifully. So I would never have an argument. I think that bringing, don't forget the majority of the tissue has to heal to the glenoid neck. Really, if what we're doing, we're repositioning the labrum and we're bringing the tissue. So as you said and showed in your presentation, I really take the capsule off of the subscapularis partially to really create that the, the tissue almost looks like it sits in the correct location before I put my first suture in. But as you said, half my operation and half your operation is just mobilization and releases. So I think you want to prepare the best surface. Now, no matter what we do, you should, if you ever get an opportunity to look in back in your shoulder a year later, you'll realize that the articular surface becomes perfectly smooth with your labrum and your capsule. There's no bumper a year later. It's like yes. you're the first water skier out on the lake on Sunday morning, but I'm holding you up. But nevertheless, <laughs> it's perfectly smooth. There's no bumps. So there's a remodeling that occurs here. So the answer is, of course, you, you really want to have the best opportunity to heal. And 
you need to take the extra time. And, and whether you use that liberator that I saw Sanjay use when I was visiting and use the curette, you're not trying to remove healthy articular cartilage. You just want to create the most advantageous healing response as you can and have the least amount of tissue pulling on it in the wrong directions. Like the subscapularis pulls your tissue medially and creates your ALPSA effect. So you want to do a little bit of releasing of your capsule from your subscap so that it's not pulling your repair away from your articular margin. And that's one of the reasons we don't exercise people right away. We want people to let them sit in some internal rotation for a period to allow that initial seal and healing response to begin because our sutures are just holding everything in place. They're not, they're not going to protect the next dislocation probably. Right, thank you. Uh, Neeraj, uh, any questions on online? Hello? Uh, let me check, let me check. Just refreshing now. Yes. Give me one second. No, we don't have any more questions. Thank you very much. So, Sanjay Desai sir is having uh, one another talk, I think, on the posterior lateral repair. Yes, sir, you can go ahead. You can take the talk. Yes. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Uh, will you let me share the screen? Sir, you are co-host, you can share the screen. Okay, fine. Yes, it's working now. Yeah, so I'm going to make this uh, uh, nice and short, uh, just a few slides. Uh, uh, it's... Saturday night for Jeff there. And uh, so a few, few important uh, points about posterior instability or posterior labrum repair. Number one is uh, it's uncommon. Uh, it's about around uh, eight to 10% of all the instabilities that I treat. Unlike anterior instability, the most common presentation is pain. And occasionally you can have episodes of subluxation but it is very unusual to have a posterior frank dislocation uh, uh, kind of presentation that you typically see in the anterior dislocations. So it is pain and subluxations, that's the commonest. And when it is traumatic, it is the position of adduction, flexion and internal rotation when a person falls in that position that you get posterior instability and overuse leading to posterior instability is more common. So there are some more peculiarities. The reverse bank cart I have noticed is minimally displaced, unlike the anterior bank cart. The reverse hill sacs is not very apparent, is not very distinct, uh, like in anterior dislocations where you have a posterior hill sacs very clear cut in, in, in posterior instability, it's not very clear, it's not very distinct. Uh, uh, when you have a pure traumatic event of a posterior uh, instability, it, it often does not develop into recurrent posterior instability. It is the more repetitive micro trauma variety which tends to go into recurrent posterior instability. So here is one example. Uh, that's the cannula in the posterior portal. And uh, this is exactly what I explained to you that these posterior bank cards are not very badly displaced. In fact, you have to look for them. You have to feel for it. Uh, this is the anterior labrum. It's, it's okay. Uh, 
by repetitive trauma, this is what seems to happen. You let it, it leads to rim loading, the labrum becomes uh, flattened, and the head keeps rolling uh, a little beyond what it should. And this is how it leads to instability and pain. You may have again capsular laxity or because of repetitive trauma, it leads to rim loading and then posterior labrum lesions and finally pain and instability. Uh, there are some thoughts that in these patients, they have uh, a problem with the version, uh, but I'm not so sure whether I have seen too many of these uh, version problems. Examination, typically they are young, active patients, uh, uh, and the pain is related to activity. And some provocative signs may be positive, but it's the high index of suspicion, which is the key to diagnosing a posterior instability. Uh, we all know the Kim's test, flexion, adduction, internal rotation. Uh, it's a provocative test. You're just trying to recreate posterior instability and the patient is in pain. Uh, the jerk test, again, as we all know, flexion, adduction, you hold the elbow and try to sublux the humeral head posteriorly. But these are uh, not easy to, to, to do with consistency and repeatedly. Uh, so uh, once again, I repeat, it's a high index of suspicion. Uh, what will you look for? You will, on, on imaging, you will look, look for glenoid hypoplasia. I'll show you some examples. Uh, you want to look for reverse uh, Hill sack, uh, reverse bony bank card, reverse hill sacks, reverse bank card, loose capsule, and Kim's lesion. So here is a, a reverse uh, bank card lesion, as you can see here very well. Uh, the high signal on the posterior labrum, which is detached. Uh, glenoid hypoplasia, uh, three different varieties over here. One, two, and three. See the flattening of the glenoid in the lower left picture, and a very severe glenoid hypoplasia leading to posterior instability. Uh, one of my cases, a uh, physician, uh, this is an orthopedic surgeon by profession, uh, and you can see that quite a severe uh, glenoid hypoplasia uh, with posterior instability. Just like ALPSA, you can have a periosteal sleeve avulsion posteriorly. Nice MRI picture to show you. And uh, rarely you can have a, a haggle of the reverse kind, posterior band. And because of repeated uh, instability, you can develop a Bennett's lesion. These are some examples for you to appreciate. Now, arthroscopic surgery. Of course, I would try conservative treatment first. Uh, give it a good six months of conservative treatment. And if it doesn't work, then I will propose. Uh, the two common operations I do is a posterior bank art repair and a capsulography because I do believe that many of these posterior instabilities are a part of multidirectional instability. Yeah. And therefore, these patients, when you put a scope in, it's not too surprising that they have lesions on the anterior side as well, instead of just pure posterior uh, uh, lesions. Uh, so this is a little uh, tip when I am anticipating uh, a, essentially a posterior surgery then the posterior portal, do not make it as you normally do, but shift it a little laterally. Why? Because you don't want to come flush to the glenoid. You want to come at an angle. So shift it laterally and little superiorly towards the acromion. You modify your posterior entry portal because eventually that's where your large plastic cannula will lie. And if your uh, posterior portal is not a little uh, lateral and superior, then you may end up coming flush to the glenoid. It will be very hard to drill uh, properly into the glenoid bone. So this is an important tip I can share with you. Uh, open surgeries, uh, there are many described, uh, posterior capsular of the open, uh, capsulotinodesis, uh, Richard Hawkins has uh, uh, described, and uh, uh, posterior uh, uh, PIGHL uh, reconstruction by Craig Morgan. But I have little experience. I have, I have not had to do all of these uh, uh, prognosis. Uh, I will share the literature with you. Uh, here is the, the data. Uh, three fourths will be, uh, approximately three fourths will be satisfied after this procedure. So in summary, it's uncommon. 
It's a complex problem. Often it is part and parcel of MDI. Usually it is overuse or repetitive trauma. Recurrent subluxation is more common than a frank dislocation. And I prefer arthroscopic technique. But remember, posterior instability is much more than just a reverse bank art. Thank you. Are you there? Yes, sir, we are here. Uh, I'll just stop your screen share so everybody can come and have a discussion on this. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think Satish, Satish, I think got disconnected by mistake. He will come back. Okay. Dr. Abrams, I know it is very late for you. Do you have any questions for Dr. Sanjay Desai? I was just going to say, are you, uh, Sanjay, again, very nicely done. Um, do you do anything with the posterior capsule? In other words, if you're, the pathologies of posterior recurrent instability, subluxations, it's sometimes the labrum is torn. Sometimes the capsule labrum is torn. Sometimes the capsules detached from the humeral head. Do you routinely do anything like with your posterior portal when you're done doing your medial repair? Do you routinely put any, uh, do any uh, soft tissue to soft tissue sutures in the capsule like where your portal was? If I understand your question, do I do any capsular tightening besides the repair? Yes, almost all the time. And as opposed to anterior stabilization, are you willing to take a little bit of a bigger bite posteriorly because there's very little disability from a little bit of tightening posteriorly? So we tend to err on a little bit more rather than a little bit less. Absolutely. Spot on, Jeff. Uh... Uh, our thinking is very similar. I know what you're uh, uh, guiding uh, the audience into, but yes, you need to over tighten when you are doing posterior surgery as against anterior surgery. I completely agree with you. Is Satish back? Yeah. Yes, sir. There's a network failure to that. Uh, so, Dr. Sanjay, uh, uh, excellent demonstration and uh, a good review. Um, uh, one thing is, uh, as you said, uh, putting in an 8mm cannula at the back might be tricky and difficult and the capsule is already so flimsy. Uh, that's what Dr. Um, Jeff was saying. After putting the cannula and removing the cannula, you're left with a big uh, hole there. Will you, will you tend to close that hole? Uh, that was the question he was asking. So I, uh, uh, I tend not to put a cannula at all. I actually do it. Uh, so that adds to one more step. Uh, like you have to uh, take both the sutures to, with a retriever um, because um, there is a um, risk of soft tissue entanglement. That's the one uh, adds to one more step, but then it avoids putting in a big cannula at the back. I know it's a little a small hassle, but uh, sometimes getting that big 8mm cannula at the back can be tricky. Okay. That's a good tip. Any other questions, guys? Satish, you are not mute. audible. You are mute. Neeraj, do you have any online questions? Nitesh, na, Nilesh, I think we should be able to hear you now. Yeah, yeah, now this is, yeah. Yeah, Satish. Yeah. Okay. Nilesh, can you speak up? Yeah, I think. Right. I think. I think Satish is uh, is not on not uh, online, or I think we are not getting an audio signal from him. But uh, but I would like to thank both uh, Dr. Jeff Abrams and Dr. Sanjay Desai, as well as uh, Dr. Neha and uh, Kartik for their for their participation and uh, conducting this wonderful shoulder symposium. And I know it's it's a uh, it's quite late for Dr. Abrams and we won't uh, hold him back longer. And likewise, for Dr. Desai, he's got a Sunday to rest it out because I think uh, starting Monday, most of the hospitals in Bombay are kind of coming back to their mainstream work. So I would again like to thank all of you and uh, thank you, uh, Neeraj, for coordinating this. Thank
Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.